Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Sri Ram Kumar here. It's a pleasure to be back with you on TLR shows. And uh, today's uh, show is indeed special. It is our 91st show. And considering we have somebody associated with uh, cricket on the show today, yes, we are in our nervous 90s. And uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome someone whom I have followed for a very long time, whose work I have been following for a very long time, I'm sure uh, most of us have. He's a high performance coach, an author, a sportsman who excelled in both cricket and rugby. And then he transitioned into being a, a strength and mental conditioning coach for his national team. He's no stranger to India. The, the absolute joy that we had on April 2nd, 2011. A lot of credit goes to the other gentleman you see on the screen. Paddy Upton, welcome to TLR Shows. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure to have you. Thanks very much, Sri Ram, and thanks very much for the invitation to come and share with you and spend some time with you on the show today. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Paddy. Uh, Paddy, uh, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about a lot on how do we start the conversation, <laughs> etc. You know, so I thought, why don't we kind of go back in time? And uh, I read that, you know, you were good at both cricket and rugby. And uh, at the age of uh, 25, you gave up competitive sport and uh, you became a strength and conditioning coach. So I was very curious to know, and I'm sure most of our viewers are, on uh, how did this transition happen? After all, 25 is an age when you're ready yeah. to go. How did this transition happen? And how did you look at strength and conditioning as a dimension to uh, move into? Uh, yeah, thanks very much. I mean, when you say going back in time between the two of us with not much hair in our heads, it's quite a long time. At least it's not as far <laughs> back as when uh, I didn't go to university in an ox wagon, at least. So, um, you know, Sri, when I was at university, I, I kept studying. I went from one degree to the next, to an honors, to a master's degree. And at the time, I was studying a master's degree at the University of Cape Town. I was playing a fairly good level of rugby. I was playing first team rugby at the university. I was also playing, um, I just broken into the provincial uh, cricket setup or state in, in India would be the equivalent of state cricket setup. I got 100 on my uh, first class debut. And I got a phone call one day from uh, Professor Tim Noakes, who worked close. of the South African team and and they said we think cricket or fitness is important enough in international cricket to have a full-time fitness trainer because at the time bizarrely in 1994 which wasn't a whole long time ago well at least not for some of us um cricket was already professional but there were only three members of a support staff in any in every international cricket team in the world at the time there was the coach there was a manager and there was a physiotherapist that was it so I effectively was being offered what at the time was the first time that this fourth position was now opening up as a full-time fitness trainer to the Proteas and international cricket. And my decision was, do I continue my, my academic career, which was always going to support my um, work. So that was quite simple. I was able to actually take my studies onto the road. And then it was a decision. I liked rugby more than I liked cricket, actually, but I wasn't as good a rugby player, so I wasn't going to make it. And I probably wasn't, in fact, I knew, not probably, I wasn't single-minded enough to absolutely dedicate all of my time, energy, effort to invest in just playing cricket, which was required at that time if you wanted to kick on. I, I enjoyed my rugby. I enjoyed my cricket. Um, I enjoyed my fishing. I wanted to study university. I wanted to travel. So I actually didn't have, and I wasn't prepared to bring the dedication to playing cricket. So for me, it was a fairly easy option. It was difficult to give up playing cricket and rugby, but I knew at some point I would. And here I was offered really a blank slate. I was effectively the first fitness trainer in professional cricket in the world. So I had the opportunity to, to automatically be in the international cricket circuit, to move in that world, to move with those players. But instead of hitting cricket balls and bowling balls, I was there to help people 
hopefully hit balls more often and bowl a bit faster and take some more wickets. So it wasn't a difficult decision. Uh, and I guess I was very lucky at the age of, you know, and I was in my early 20s to have the choice of choosing state, university, pursue professional sports, or I got this wonderful opportunity. And I remember I was at university when I was invited to this interview um, with a whole lot of other university professors and people much more senior to me for this new role of mental, uh, sorry, of fitness trainer back in those days. We didn't even call it strength and conditioning coach. And I had to borrow a smart shirt from someone and borrow a pair of smart shoes and try and remember how to tie a tie because I was basically just a pretty casual university student and had to mm -hmm. pretend to be all um, formal to sit in this interview for this job. So long mm -hmm. story, but a fairly easy decision to decide to go with fitness mm -hmm. training ahead of my other options. That's interesting, Pat. Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, good to see, you know, that, uh, I mean, I, I think the choice was very clear for you. you. You clearly saw that, you know, the kind of uh, focus that the game of cricket required or the game of rugby required. And then you had something here as an option. And, and yeah, you think, joined that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So I think I was lucky. If I, if I look at some kids today who are are pushed into a career or, or feel coerced or feel obliged to go into a career. And it could easily have been if I was in another family or maybe even in India that I might have felt compelled or coerced or pushed to pursue cricket because it were as a career, because it was more glamorous and uh, more sought after. So I guess I was lucky. And in hindsight, I didn't realize it at the time that I really was lucky and fortunate to, at that young age, make a decision for myself and my career that wasn't overly influenced by other people. Sure, I took information, but I think a lot of youngsters these days, a lot of people find themselves studying something or find themselves in a career. And after a few years or maybe a number of years, they look back and they go, but this isn't my career. This isn't my choice. I'm, I'm I'm actually doing this for somebody else. And it's quite sad when I come across people who realize they're walking somebody else's path. Sure, uh, sure, Paddy. And, and I do see that a lot when I uh, talk to people and when I coach people. Uh, j just a bit again, uh, going back to you becoming a fitness coach, when did you actually transition to a strength and a mental conditioning coach? Because as you said, these were times when the physical fitness, it was a time when probably two things were more uh, focused on, your level of physical fitness and your ability to play the game, be it any sport. Yes. The, the mental so, dimension yeah. of it was not such a big thing. So how did you transition into yeah. that? So it was actually quite a long transition. So mm -hmm. one side spent four years with the South African team and sort of pretty much, it was quite easy to get the South African team to be the fittest team in the world then because we were the only team with a trainer. But over that few years, every, all other teams around the world started following suit and I also got fitness trainers. And I felt that I had, I had done as much as I could as a fitness trainer. And from there, my decision was, well, move on away from the team with a profile that I'd got, maybe set up some gyms or biokinetics practices, which what I was trained as, as I had a master's in sports science and an honors in biokinetics. So I could have gone into business and used that and continued in that career. But for me, when I looked around at professional sport and what it required to get to the top, we had a, one of the best coaches in the world at the time in Bob Woolmer. Uh, we had the fittest team in the world at the time because we were the only team that had a fitness trainer. I wasn't necessarily that good. I was just bumbling along, figuring my way. Um, and for me, it's okay, so what's next? And I didn't think that we had reached anywhere near our potential, not as a team. And when I looked around at the individuals, and we had some great players in, Alan Donald, Brian McMillan, Dave Richardson, John T. Rhodes, Gary Kirsten, Daryl Cullen, and so some really, really good players, Sean Pollocks. And I felt that there was a new di another dimension. There was something missing. And for me, I didn't actually know what that something missing was, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew there was something short, something needed to happen. And, and I ended up going on a journey of doing a number of different things, working in some other industries. And I worked for two years on the streets, uh, working with hardened street children's and built up a street children's organization, which was a, a big deviation from the world of international sport, but actually quite similar in that I was... I was dealing with the best of the best and only the best actually managed to survive and thrive 
living on the streets and the, through the hardships of the city. So I was still working with the best of the best in a survival of the fittest game. The game was just fundamentally different. And it was only a, a probably four or five years later when I actually did a second master's degree in business coaching. And I understood more about the philosophy of business coaching and why is business coaching now at this, this was sort of in the early 2000, 21st, sort of 2001 to why is business coaching suddenly so important at the time? It was actually the second fastest growing profession in the world behind IT. Mm -hmm. And as I came to understand how the leadership terrain was fundamentally changing from the industrial era's command and control approach to leadership to now this new knowledge age a leadership where you can no longer lead because as a leader with instruction because you're the content expert because the internet has taken the expertise out of people's heads and it's made it available to everyone so it was during studying that and actually i did spend the first five six years of my coaching career doing more work in as a business and a leadership co coach in business but i always saw that this was the miss something missing that i had seen in cricket and it was the way the coaches were coaching, number one. Still, many coaches are stuck in this old school command and control, my way or the highway, um, authoritarian, top-down leadership approach or coaching approach that really doesn't work as much anymore. In fact, it's pretty obsolete now in 2021 um, in most industries and in most places. And um, along with that, the mental game, we started to understand, now, okay, how we... The, how important the mental game is, but not how we always knew it was important, but we now started through coaching, understanding how do we work with a mental game, um, which interestingly has been something, it's always been important and traditionally sports psychologists are the people in charge with working with the mental side of the game. But the reality is even today, very few teams have a full-time sports psychologist. There's a lot of sports psychologists out there, but they're not working full time with the top professional teams. So there's something of a mismatch the way we've been putting together sports psychology in the mental game and actually applying it within a team environment. And I guess having been involved, I started figuring out what that gap was. And so it was a fairly natural progression for me to then find myself as a mental coach, which interestingly was now 10 years later, 10 years before I was the first fitness trainer in world cricket and that was purely by chance i don't take any credit whatsoever it's just because hansi crinney and bob warmer decided that and they phoned me and now i find myself as a you know full-time mental coach in sport which it's been a fascinating journey and we i'm only just getting a glimmer of actually what's important and how how to go about finding the solutions to taking the mental game to the next level sure Sure, buddy. I think two things stood out for me from what you said. One is we are living in an era where knowledge is no longer here, but it's out there on any phone or any laptop. So, yes. so today, I think the one of the biggest challenges for leaders um, today is how do you get high collaboration in the team? And I think a great deal of comes mm -hmm. to when uh, a leader starts thinking, behaving, and demonstrating himself or herself as a coach. So what are your thoughts on that? How, how does this transition happen? It's not easy for leaders. No. It's a very new way of managing. So, again, I'm going to generalize here, but I think it's yeah. not easy for anyone who is, say, 50, 45, 50 years old and older to shift from that old style of command and control to a more collaborative coaching style, facilitative style of leadership. Because anyone who's 45, 50 years old was at school and your sports coaches and your teachers and your first bosses, and we would have been modeled the old style of command and control industrial era model of leadership. And it's very diff difficult, particularly when you've got to a fairly high level um, of achievement to fundamentally change what you're doing and change the things that have actually brought you to that level already. So that's very difficult, I agree, for particularly for older leaders and 55, 60-year-old leaders, it's even more difficult to say, you, you are an old dog that's massively experienced, but you really do need to pick up, take a cup, get a couple of new tricks. Um, 
I think for younger leaders, what I've certainly experienced both in South Africa, Australia, I've done a fair, fair bit of work in India, the younger folk, you know, the leaders sort of 30, 35 year olds, they're quite quick to adopt this coaching facilitative approach because they realize that they are not the all knowing. They cannot be the expert. The expertise sits in the collective and the leader's role then is instead of to impose their knowledge on the team and impose the instruction, it's actually to e extract the best knowledge that sits within the group. Um, so either way, whether it's easy or difficult, if you're going to prevail as a leader or even a sports coach going forward, you need to update your coaching leadership software to, or your leadership software to a more coaching facilitative employee centered and sport we call what player centered approach and it's it's it's, it's probably even more difficult for sports coaches <clears throat> because they are all called coaches in business mm -hmm. the leader is called a leader and the mm -hmm. coach is a different thing in business and we understand the distinction between a leader and a coach and of course a leader can use a coaching approach but in sport, coaches use a very dictatorial instruction based style traditionally and still largely today. And they are called a coach. So it's even more difficult to suggest to a coach in, in sport that you coach, you actually need to do a bit more coaching. And they say, no, but I'm a coach. I do coach. And it's like, so you're an instructor. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a tough dilemma to get over. The second point, uh, Paddy, uh, based on what you said earlier was. Uh, one is the uh, knowledge and, and the fact that it's distributed across. And as you rightly said, you need to get the best out of people. The second is the enormous amount of pressure that leaders today handle. And uh, people in general, not just leaders, irrespective of whether it is in sport or people working in organizations or entrepreneurs, you name it. And, and uh, COVID has kind of, you know, accentuated the whole thing mm. further. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of uh, reach out to you and, uh, you know, understand uh, uh, how do how uh, how do you see this entire uh, concept of pressure? It's it's a such a big part of our lives. Yeah. And uh, even then, even today, I think uh, very few of us talk about it openly. And and how do you think organizations, leaders, even peers in a group acknowledge that this is something normal and this is something that needs to be addressed, spoken about, and, and probably, you know, accepted as part of a, a normal course. I mean, you can't be the superstar all day, all through. Yes. Yeah. You know, what you say is so true. There is a lot of pressure around. It's, it's increasing now with the amount of complexity and what's going on in the world. <laughs> Um, and pressure is, it's a simple word, but it's actually a really complex phenomenon. And I like to, I like to, in any one of these things, break it down into fairly simple parts. And sure. for me, to a large degree, mm -hmm. pressure is just a concept. It's not real. It's not a real tangible thing. The experience of pressure is a felt experience that we can measure in our heart rate and our pulse and etc. Um, but it's just a concept and it's a concept that we create for ourselves in our own minds. So it's a self created concept and the way we do that generally is by the amount of importance we place on whatever we're doing. So traditionally or one of the definitions of pressure is that it's directly proportionate to the amount of importance we place on a result. So a very typical example, the South African cricket team, the Proteus go to World Cup events like they're at now. They've got this chokers, la chokers label and they have been for a number of tournaments so desperate. It's so important to break through, to get to final and win a World Cup, to get rid of this chokers label. And it's become so important now. And because they place the importance on it, it just increases the pressure. So for me, it's, it's useful for people to first know that the pressure you're experiencing, you're actually creating in your own mind for yourself. It's just a concept. So where are you placing too much importance on what you're doing? If it's on a World Cup uh, game, at the end of the road, what we need to do is get some perspective. A game is just a, it's just a game of cricket. 
yes, we are passionate fans and we really want our team to win. But you know what? After India recently just lost to Pakistan, there was a few nasty things said on Twitter. And the next day, the sun still came up at the same time. The end of that next day, the sun still went down at the same time. And it, life went on. Um, but the amount, the degree to which we were attached to India losing that game is the degree to or the anxiety or the upset, the frustration we would experience. But if you don't really care about cricket that much, then you wouldn't have worried too much. So it is a concept we create for ourselves, number one. So when you feel pressure, where are you overvaluing something, even work, even money? You, we can't take money with us. When we go to the grave, it stays be, be at, at home. Yes, it enables us to live a certain lifestyle, but it's not everything. Our health is probably the most important thing we've got. So when our health is under threat, that's probably a good, a, a decent reason to actually feel real pressure. But for the rest, it's just a game. Business is a game. Life is a game. Cricket's a game. And if we see it as a game, we can decrease the amount of pressure. And the other area of pressure that comes from is when we when we find ourselves dealing with massive amounts of complexity. And again, it's either a function of our inability to deal with the whole of the complexity, which means we've probably risen to too high a position in leadership if you can't deal with that level of complexity. Or the other thing is, how am I overcomplicating things? And I need to simplify it. So if we can decrease the importance or get some perspective on the importance of whatever it is that we're facing that's creating the pressure, and we can simplify some of the complexity the pressure naturally, it will still be there, but it'll be the volume will be turned down and it'll be at a much more manageable level. And even more importantly, at a level that's not a significant threat to our mental, emotional and physical health. That's really the pressure is not the problem. It's the effect on our bodies and our well-being of long term sustained pressure. And again, I say it one more time. We create pressure. We do it to ourselves. That, that's interesting, Paddy. That's interesting. And, and uh, it brings to fore another point that uh, it, it's incredible, uh, you know, um, the amount of pressure are these sports, uh, uh, the sportsmen are under. We tend to look at the glamorous side, you know, the, 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 uh, the aura around them money and you know all the fancy stuff the instagram posts and what have you but it requires so much of conditioning and uh, to be able to do uh, you know bring that distance which is another thing i wanted to you know uh, check with you and one thing i always felt is pressure comes when there is a constant struggle between wanting to perform and wanting to outperform i mean that's the way i see it yeah. So you need to be on a constant, uh, you know, adrenaline, supercharged, giving that 110% always. So I think that also, how, how do players manage these? You know, you, you work with yeah. players across diverse sports. How do, you, how, how do they actually handle this? Talk to me a little bit about your understanding. It's an interesting concept that perform versus outperform. Just give me a little bit more around that. Okay. Sure, uh, sure, buddy. So there is a, a there is a the way I see pressure is there is a need for me to perform, do to the best of my ability, mm -hmm. and and uh, you know things like that. And then there is an additional uh, requirement. I wouldn't call it a burden. There is an additional requirement to be outperforming constantly, to be getting okay. better at what I do. Okay. So when this chasm goes up, pressure accumulates. Yes. I don't see the results coming in quickly. Yeah. So again, I'm going to go back to one of the your comments earlier, where you said there's these athletes or these cricketers are under tremendous pressure. They're not. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of them choose to adopt a mental position that leaves them experiencing themselves under a whole lot of pressure. But mm -hmm. if I look at players like a Hashim Amla, for example, um, he experienced very little pressure because he didn't make results weren't his God. Cricket wasn't his God. Winning wasn't massively important and losing wasn't devastatingly um, disappointing. 
he he wanted to score runs and he didn't want to do badly. But whether he got 311, which he did in a test match or not, it didn't really impact him as a human being too much. So he was so secure within himself that he was able to separate himself from his results. What he did do, however, is he prepared and he gave his absolute best. He didn't, he prepared and, and practiced probably better or as well as almost anyone that I know. So he gave his 100% effort to his performance, but he was completely unattached to his results. And as a result of being unattached to results, he had very little pressure. Yes, mm -hmm. there was a bit, and we do need, and there is a, in sports psychology and psychology, a very simple pressure curve that we all literally operate along, um, is that if, if there isn't enough pressure, we tend to be, we don't, we're not aroused enough to bring our best performance. When there's just a su sufficient amount of pressure and challenge and anxiety, or it's really challenge, that brings the best out in us. And as the pressure or the challenge get, becomes too great, then we start dropping off because we become over-aroused, over-stressed, or over-anxious. So everyone, generally our performance follows that graph. The graph is in, just in different places. Some people feel that optimal pressure fairly early on. I call those in sports sort of medium pressure experts. So those guys who, who perform and they do their best when there's not a whole lot of tension or challenge in the game. And then you have very few people who, what I call high pressure experts, is when the perceived pressure is very high, like an MS Dhoni is able to do under the highest pressure, that brings the best out in him. MS Dhoni in test cricket, when there's no real height of pressure, he didn't do very well. It didn't bring the best out in him. So number one is there is an optimal level. And if we try and push ourselves too hard, too much, too fast, we're going to get into burnout or overstress or be overaroused and it's not going to perform. But those people sitting in the couch and just sitting in the momentum mediocrity and not really wanting to perform at their best level, well, they're also not going to perform at their best level. So it's really understanding what is it that brings out the best in me, the, the right amount of pressure, the right amount of challenge, the right amount of pressure to be better and better. Um, and, and it's having a balance of that. And by the same token, we can't always want to be better and better and better. Sometimes we need to pause. We need to take a rest. Even a marathon runner will slow down and take a drink at a water table and just to, um, replenish themselves. So it's, it's maintaining a healthy balance between pushing and striving and re-energizing when we need to. Sure. Sure, uh, buddy. So that's at an uh, individual level, one needs to be conscious where probably one is along the stress curve, etc. Now, uh, you know, taking a bit further from that, as a leader, when you're leading a team of people, obviously there are some people who take the pressure well and they're able to perform under, uh, you know, extremely tough situations. And there are probably some people who are just not able to gel well with the entire uh, uh, team or probably taken that kind of pressure so how, how does how does a leader deal with such situations considering the fact that you know it's a combination each of them brings something to the table no doubt how do you think dealers or uh, leaders ought to be dealing with this so i mean your question really triggers it triggers a very practical example that I go back to a conversation that we had in the lead up to the 2011 World Cup with the Indian team as we were at that time and preparing for that tournament. No, t no host nation had won a World Cup at home. Mm -hmm. And one of the assumptions at the time, which was potentially the additional pressure of playing at home and in front of home crowds in such a big tournament that maybe it was that. We didn't know that was the assumption. And we knew India playing a World Cup at home was going to constitute the highest pressure that any of those players had ever played under in their in their lives. Um, knowing also that we're preparing to play a final in the Wankhede Stadium uh, in Sachin Tendulkar's fifth World Cup, his final World Cup game in front of his home crowd, the pressure there was going to be probably greater than almost any team had experienced in the history of cricket up until that time. Sure. Um, and one of the conversations was 
guys, if we look to and we rely on the senior players, because you did have a Tendulka, Savag, you had an MS Dhoni, um, Yuvrad Singh hadn't been in great form up until then. He was in good form, but he certainly found renewed form in the World Cup. So we had three or four players who were potentially our match-winning players. And the conversation was that, guys, we cannot rely on other people or the big match players or the senior players to carry the full burden of pressure throughout this tournament. Because if we do that, at some point, the pressure on them is going to be too much and they're going to want to walk away from it. So we have to be aware that we've got to distribute the pressure across this next eight weeks. And when it's your time and it's your moment, you need to absorb all the pressure for the team at that time. If you're the bowler with the ball in your hand, it's not about just finishing you over and then waiting for Harbhajan Singh on the other side or Zahir Khan to go and rescue and pull the game back. You need to take the burden of pressure. And every time you walk out to bat, even if you're the number 10 batsman, that's your opportunity to take the burden of pressure for scoring runs for this team. And if we can distribute that, and not all at the same time and not equally, but just when it's your time, be prepared now to stand up and say, okay, I will take this burden of pressure. And if you see somebody is feeling the burden of pressure, all of us must be aware of that and we must go across to them and lighten that load. Take the load from them. Say, it's okay, I will, I've got this one. Um, and it really was that philosophy of everyone buying into sharing the burden. Even the one player who was maybe only going to play one game, maybe someone who was on the bench, it, you too have got an equal burden to carry, to support players and to support the team. And I think that really helped when there was that understanding that we can't rely on those big players all the time. I think it's just not somebody... realistic. Sure. I think it's a very powerful concept, uh, Paddy, and I just noted it down. Sharing the burden, right? And and I think that's something that's that's going to take a lot of my time thinking over. So moving on, Paddy, uh, we we spoke about pressure. We spoke about the expectations. Allied with that are setbacks. And you can call them failures, defeats, what have you. I prefer to use the word setbacks yeah. because there's obviously an opportunity to bounce back from those. And and uh, I, I probably think no nobody illustrates the power of coming back from a setback better than sportsmen do. Yes. It's not a rosy uh, picture all, all uh, the way. So what is uh, your work been with sportsmen across diverse uh, games in helping them overcome these setbacks does it really differ from game to game or is it to do all with the individual um you know when it comes to setbacks sriram in 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 any walk of life they mm -hmm. happen they're a given they're a guaranteed in fact, in cricket, as a batsman, you will fail more times than you succeed if you use 50 as success. And as a bowler, if you use three wickets, maybe in the short format or five wickets in the longer format, you will fail more times than you succeed. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's failure and setbacks is not the problem. Mm -hmm. It's how we behave around setbacks that is worth shining a light on. And there's two places I'd really shine a light is there's a lot of spoken about that athletes. And I, I do believe that one of the biggest, two biggest mental obstacles to success in certainly in professional sport and I would hazard, hazard a guess in life is number one is pressure and number two is fear. And we've already spoken that pressure is a concept and fear is also a concept that we create for ourselves in our own mind. And fear of failure in sport is probably the biggest um subcategory of fear that ob that obstructs players performance and i for a long time i was trying to work with players to try and decrease their fear of failure and what occurred to me and it's a hypothesis i'm playing with is that it's not so much the the failure that players are worried about it's the fear of repercussion of the failure 
that's the problem. So how is the coach going to behave? What is the coach going to think? Is the coach going to be upset? And no player wants to upset a coach they look up to or a captain they look up to. So the, the more a coach gesticulates and throws their arms up in the air or behave, or the more a captain throws up in his arms in the air or kicks the ground or throws his cap on the ground when a player makes a mistake, the more that behavior increases the fear of failure in players. And they say that. Players openly say, young players, and you can ask them that young players who play early on under Virat Kohli, they are terrified of dropping a catch or misfielding. And as a result, it creates that. Where players talk about when they play under an MS Dhoni and they make a mistake, they don't get that overt display of disappointment. And no one wants to disappoint either a Kohli or a, a, Kohli or a Dhoni. So the one piece is to really look at as leaders, how are you behaving when somebody in your team makes a mistake or a failure or fails? Uh, because our behavior determines the level of fear that they will experience to a large degree, number one. And number two, it's for individuals. How do you speak to yourself and address yourself and deal with yourself when you make that failure or that mistake or that error? If you're someone who beats yourself up, that's not nice. You will put pressure on yourself not to fail. So can you accept that? And for me, the mantra is as long as you try your best and you be as smart as possible. So it's effort and intelligence. So when you give your best, the results do not matter at all. So if you try your best and fail, what's important is that you've tried your best. So failing or not succeeding or making a mistake is completely okay. But not trying and making a mistake, that's not okay. The not trying is a mistake. So how are leaders, how are you behaving around people's mistakes? And as an individual, how are you behaving and speaking to yourself around the mistake? And if we speak to ourselves and we behave differently, we naturally decrease that fear of the repercussion of failure. That's just a hypothesis. I don't need to be right. And I'd be fascinated to, to hear your, anybody else's, inputs or particularly counter views or on that sure sure buddy i think uh, uh, i would think it kind of uh, makes sense principally because obviously there is a repercussion and and uh, sport being the kind of uh, any sport having the kind of visibility it has is obviously the glamour there's a commercial element there is uh, there's a whole lot of expectation from you. You have to live up to an image. Obviously, the the fear of failure is, in my view, yes, it, it's going to be huge. There's no denying that. And I think uh, how the people you look up to behave with you and how you behave yourself. Conceptually, yes, I think the hypothesis makes sense. Of course, yes, so one still needs to you know, kind of dwell into it. Yeah. Uh, but, well, no, I, but, one, but One of the interesting things sure. to throw with that, sorry to interrupt, sure. Shiram, is... um. You know, I, I, Google did a two-year study on what really constitutes and makes successful teams mm -hmm. uh, in the modern business place. And you may mm -hmm. well be aware of the study, and there's been a couple sure. done like that. And that's where what, what's come out of those studies is psychological safety. Is sure. one of the things that, that, that characterize the most successful teams today and psychological safety. And one of the things that goes with that and what those studies showed is that the most successful teams – are the ones that make the most mistakes. Mm -hmm. Because they're trying things. And when you try new things and you try and innovate and you try and attack and you get on the front foot, you will make mistakes. And if you feel, if there is the safety and the comfort to be able to know if we try our best, we've got the support, we go and if we make mistakes, we stand up, dust ourselves off and we keep moving. And the more times we do that, the further we'll get ahead. So it's, it's a fascinating concept that that the most successful teams in business are those that make the most mistakes okay of course i'm not talking about accountancy business and law firms and people like that so it's it's within the more the more creative industries that would be sure sure uh, buddy uh, moving ahead uh, another uh, dimension that i wanted to you know kind of uh, talk to you about was Obviously, uh, be it rugby or be it cricket or be it any sport, it's a team game. Mm -hmm. And uh, as is any business, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, 
trying to do what they do. They obviously want to add value, serve their customers, do their best for their employees. So there are a wide vari a range of emotions coming into play there. And then there are teams, there are high performers, there are high potentials. So obviously this kind of, you know, can set off uh, triggers, which could be because of uh, the kind of expectations they have, the kind of uh, outlook they have. I mean, take an Indian cricket team at, at any point in time, you have five or six, uh, you know, superstars, so to say, playing. And, and I'm sure every uh, leader is also grappling with this challenge. How do I handle my high performers? And at the same time, how do I nurture, give space to my high potentials? Because they also need to breathe free. Those caterpillars need to become the, you know, the butterflies, so to speak. Yeah. So how does uh, one handle this? I mean, what has been your experience of watching uh, leaders from various, say, cricket teams or even business leaders handle this dimension yeah so i mean i love that question your high performers and your high potentials um there's two things that really come up for me is most teams have got a few high performers and a number a great a much greater number of high potentials mm -hmm. if i use cricket as an example let's use ipl cricket where everyone has an auction process in the same um salary cap every team has three or four natural match winners those are the high performers over the course of a 14 match season generally the majority of those perform those high performance their performances will neutralize or cancel each other's out so if four high performers in one team or three high performers for example have an unbelievable tournament let's take chennai super kings in the last they won the last one. The main reasons they won the last one was their two opening bats when we were the first and second highest run scorers in IPL. So when your high performers completely outperform all other high performers, you can win in cricket. But that seldom happens. They normally cancel each other out. So for me, what's important is it's the contribution from the high potentials. In cricket, I call them the middle management. It's mm -hmm. those players seven or, you know, five to 11, not necessarily in batting order, but just in terms of experience. It's how do our high potentials, how can we get them to perform and deliver much better than the high potentials of other teams? Because very often the winning is actually going to come from those slightly better and more consistent contributions from the high potentials. So for me personally in IPL, for example, um, I'm a big believer in you win with your high potentials. Your high performers need to deliver at least at an averagely high level that's expected of them. Sure. Um, if they don't, you're not going to win. If they're brilliant, you will. So how do you get those high potentials or get more out of your high potentials than any of your competitors are, whether it's sports or business? Number one, that's a function of leadership that to really make them feel like they belong to make them feel like they're included, to make them feel like they can really ask questions so they can learn, to, to let, have them know that they can make contributions and ideally that they can even challenge. So if they feel that much of a part of the team organization and they're actively contributing, that's probably already got you one step ahead of most of your competitors where those high potentials are just sitting in the wings and they're biding their time. Uh, and one of, so it's leadership can do that. And I honestly think that your high performers play a massive role in that. So there are, there are teams and I know there's IPL teams where you have three or four superstars and they stay separate and they act like superstars. They do their thing, they go to practice and then they go back in, the, in their own bus and they go hang in the, the, by themselves. And they don't actively engage in uplifting the high potentials those teams are not going to get very much out of the high potentials because they're going to feel that distinction, that, dif that, that distance. Sure. Where I'm a, I'm a very firm proponent of, for your high performers, let's use a cricket example, and I invite people to translate this to its relevance back into your context, is I say to the high performers, come to the, come to the ground, get everything you need. Be totally selfish in getting everything you need to be able to deliver your best possible performance. 
And when you've got that, maybe go and have a shower, have something to eat, but then come back and look around and ask yourself, what can I do to help somebody else's game and take help move them to the next level? So be selfish for yourself and then come back and be totally selfless and find, even if it's one person that you can help a little bit, and maybe it's just a conversation, but that contribution to somebody else potentially is going to be the difference between winning and losing because it's going to turn their 15 into 25 or their letting a ball bounce in front of them. It will convert that into an attempt to have a massive uh, dive to try and take a catch and they eventually take a catch of a great player. So high performers turning high potential, contributing to high potentials, I think is massive. And I think, as I said, I think your wins very often come from your high potentials because there's a lot more of them. Interesting, interesting. And and and, and, and I, I really caution about that overly selfish, self-indulgent superstar who is all about him, him or herself. Um, me personally, um, I want to shift that person to be a, a team person or contributor. And if they're a high performing individual, even if well above the rest, and they're not contributing to the team, uh, I would rather have that person out of my team. Not unlike England cricket did with Kevin Peterson. He was the best batsman in the England team, probably the best test batsman in the world at the time that they released him. And it had nothing to do with his results. It had to do with his conduct within the team. Sure. I think uh, one thing was very, very interesting for me, Paddy, in what you said. What is it that the, the, the piece about being selfish, giving my best, and then, you know, seeing the proverbial bigger canvas? Yes. How do I help somebody else? What is it that I can do? Yeah. And and no, that so probably yeah. could yeah, that could make a world yeah. of a difference. I think that's a very strong message uh, for the audience, for the leaders who are listening in. Uh, that it, it's when we are able to see the bigger picture, the proverbial canvas, and we look beyond the painting. I think that's the time magic truly happens, and I think that's when people rally around. And and now when I correlate it to all the you know people gathering around when there is a wicket captured and then you have two or three people talking to themselves even after the yeah. Denzel cheering, I'm sure those conversations in the background might have helped to that, you know yeah. that particular result. Very very yeah. insightful, Paddy. Thanks so, so much. For I, that. I would I would I would add to that. You know, there's a concept yeah. out there. That people talk about there's no I in team. Mm -hmm. I say that's rubbish. Mm -hmm. Absolutely rubbish. There has to be an I in team. Each person has to focus on themselves to deliver their best possible performance as an individual. And then look at how can I contribute to the team. So it's me and team. It's not no I and team and I just do everything to serve the team. No. You serve your own game and you serve the team games. And the best performers and leaders are able to do both, not one or the other. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Paddy, I'm sure that's going to be quite provocative for people who are listening in because it goes against the grain, but any any change is. And, and then I'm sure that will set a lot of people thinking. So uh, we, we have about 10 minutes, Paddy, and uh, yes. I just want to shift gears now yes. uh, and to, uh, want you to talk a bit about your book, The Barefoot Coach. I mean, uh, people know about it. It's on the bestseller list and what have you. But uh, I remember uh, a post by you on LinkedIn where you said that this is something that you were working in the background and, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. So how did the whole book thing come about? When did you actually think about, you know, writing a book about coaching and, and taking your entire experience and putting it on paper? Yeah, thanks for that question, Sri. Um, you know, Post, uh, once India had won the 2011 World Cup, I was asked by one or two book um, publishers to, if I would write a book. And for me, it was, I didn't, the answer was no, because I wanted the right reason to write a book. I didn't want to just write my story. Uh, there's enough cricket stories out there. Enough people know what happened. I didn't want to write my own journey. I didn't want to write a, a book on cricket stories because I'm not a player. So people would rather you know, read a, a cricket players. And it, it, when it eventually occurred to me is that I wanted to write some a book that would use cricket stories and sports stories, but it wasn't about that. It was, I really wanted to use those to hopefully add value to other people's journey. 
Um, I wanted there to be practical, relatable, down-to-earth lessons, both from success and failure. But the idea was to share the best of my, and I've been so lucky to work in the environments that I've worked in, starting with the fitness train of the South African team back in the 1990s. I was asked to do that. It wasn't of my doing. I was, Gary sure. Kirsten asked me to come and work with him with the Indian team. I coached an IPL because Rahul Dravid asked me to come and he opened the door. So I've been gifted so many of these opportunities in this experience. And it was an opportunity to share the best of my experiences with the with the idea of really adding value. And, and I deliberately wrote it for, you know, a, a more discerning reader. So there is something for someone who just wants to read cricket stories. It probably won't entirely satisfy your, your desire for cricket stories. It's not a self-help book and I don't prescribe to people. So it's sort of a balance between this cricket stories. It's not a self-help book, but it is about learning, growing and developing. Um, and the idea was that it would genuinely add value to people mm -hmm. and it's sort of written as the kind of book that i hope people would read a chapter stop and maybe make a few notes for themselves i don't ask people to do that because i don't like to patronize people but mm -hmm. the idea is that there's genuine lessons in there from my experiences sure. um and when sure. i was clear on that then it was a a long arduous four-year process to write that with right. hundreds and hundreds of hours because I'm not a proper writer. I, I like to write and I can write, but it takes me a lot longer to say what I want to say in words than it would take a trained writer. Sure, 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 buddy. And and, and and I'm sure uh, people are finding uh, value in it, and and uh, they are able to appreciate the deeper message, which is you know kind of corroborated by the fact that it's been well received. Uh, just a couple of uh, probably three questions, uh, Paddy, before we close for the evening. And I just can't believe we've been talking for about 45 yeah. minutes now. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we spoke, uh, I think, a month before we actually got on to doing the show. And uh, one of the things you said that was you're working with organizations and people to help them get their A game up, so to speak. Yes. What's this whole A game about? And, and that's something, you know, I'm yeah. curious and, and I'm sure our audience yeah. is yeah thank you so so as we went into lockdown um i really just started doing asking asking a lot of questions of uh, i was coaching some athletes around the world who are in bio bubbles and lockdowns um and i wanted to understand what all these challenges were because it was so new and one of the conversations that kept coming up people said well we need to bring our a game now to all of life not just to like we would in a sports context to an important cricket match or part of the season and the question I asked a number of people, so what do you mean by your A-game? What is your A-game? What are the components that constitute that? And interestingly, nobody was able to answer that. And then I went into Google and I said, well, so Google, tell me what, to help me understand this concept of A-game. And interestingly, Google does not have an answer. There is nothing in Google. And that really triggered my interest. And I spent three months literally trying to figure out can I with all the best of the work that I've done and all my coaching over 25 years in different environments can I come up with a framework that actually and say to people if you focus and you focus on these areas these are all the core components of an a game of your a game and my question was was there a generic one that's relevant for all of us and it it took three months to come up with something very very simple and intuitive often it happens like that we need to go through all the complexity but I've essentially came up with a six part framework built in a certain order that if mm -hmm. you have those six things and it, we all know that it's fairly intuitive, but I guide people just to deepen the foundation of their lives because many of our foundations have been rocked, just consolidate our lives in all aspects and then start getting clarity on the way forward. Even though the way forward is so unclear, I was able to find ways to give people clarity on the things that are inside of our control and you know i think over 3000 people have been through that unlock your a game process i, I deliver it over about four and between four and a half and six hours spread over maybe once or twice a week with some work in between and the feedback's been amazing that it's just given people some stability some mental well-being some clarity build the foundations and it's help, it's really just to help us navigate not through difficult times but also be even better during good times and it's something that's relevant for life we can keep adding to it so 
it was nice to be able to take a, a complex thing like that and make it very simple. Wonderful, wonderful to hear that, Paddy. And, and, and I'm glad so many people have found uh, it relevant and useful. And, and uh, I'm sure all your experience has come into it. And, and sure. I'm sure people are going to read up more. I, I request people to read up more about this and probably you know, uh, see how you can. Uh, please read up Paddy's book. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Paucity of time, I wanted to throw up a couple of questions from the book, but I, I could not. But I would request uh, folks to read up the book. There are a lot of insights there. There's a lot of, uh, I, I think what stood out for, for me was the the strong focus on cultural significance that you brought about for the Indian team's performance yes. in the World Cup. That was a revelation. A lot of good stuff out there, people. And uh, one, one last question, Paddy. Uh, are you a betting man? Whom are you going to put your money on on the World Cup, T20 World Cup now? um so number one i'm not a betting man even though i'm not uh -huh. involved in cricket i'm not allowed to be a betting man and uh -huh. what i do know about t20 cricket is there is a fair amount of luck involved so i'm mm -hmm. absolutely not going to venture um a a view on who's going to win or not um because we really don't know and the nice thing is i'm actually i'm just excited to watch really good cricket and uh excited that cricket is actually being played um and look forward to for me what's important with cricket is not so much who wins but it's how we play the game and what we learn from people who play the game well and the people who don't play the game smartly so it's the lessons from sport that really fascinate me and we're <clears> going to see most of these guys are very good friends actually playing against each other largely courtesy of ipl and the amount of cricket and these leagues so um no i couldn't venture something like sure. that but just just brief one if, if someone does want to find out a bit more about my a game stuff it's at my website would be the best place there is some information there and it's simply paddy paddyupton.com sure sure please look it up ladies and gentlemen and then yes paddy but if i could don the hat of a coach i'll say well left as a response for your previous <laughs> to my previous question so I, guess I, need to hear, I need to hear your answer, though, please. <laughs> who do you think? Not who I'm do you want to win. Who do you, who do you want? To, who do you think is going to win? Not who do you want to win? I, I do think India still has a good chance. So it, it's a combination of both the factors that you said. Yes. And uh, thanks a ton, Paddy, for all your insights. Thank you, folks, for listening in. Uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure bringing you these shows. TLR is a... Uh, coaching, training, and mentoring firm. We are, we, we are really passionate about bringing transformations in lives. And uh, the entire TLR show is to nurture and take this concept forward. We look forward to bringing you more such exciting shows. Do follow us on social media and uh, have a wonderful evening. God bless you all. Stay safe. Take care. And thanks a ton, Paddy, for taking our time and making this happen. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me as your guest today. Thank you. Bye.